Welcome to a new episode of my Dear Kitchen Helsinki podcast. My guest today is my designer friend, Saran Ganu, and he participates in the interview from the city of Pune in India. Sarang and I met when we both did our master's studies at Aalto University in Finland in the Department of Design. In the interview, we discussed how his education and life in Finland affected his work later in India. We also discussed the home compost kit he designed and the urban farm project related to it. You can learn more about both on www.theurbanfarm.in and www.homecompost.in. I hope you enjoy our discussion. As always, special thanks to my dear friend Ufuk Evjiman for the sound editing. Okay. Hi, Saran. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you doing? I'm good. Back in minus 24 degrees here in Finland. Uh, yeah, I miss Finland. It's been four years. I haven't seen the snow. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's something. I, I feel like yeah. I'm not seeing snow these days. Um, so thank you for accepting this interview. Um, this is very exciting because until now, Uh, my guests in the podcast were always in Finland doing their work or related work or research in Finland. Now you are all the way in India, but you have a connection to Finland, which we're going to talk uh, a bit more. Uh, and so it's it's really interesting to see how life continues, how what you get uh, what you got from Finland is continuing now uh, in a whole different setting. Um, But before we start, can you introduce yourself to our listeners uh, a little, like your studies, your relationship with Finland, and what you did afterwards, and so on? Sure, I can do that. Uh, so, hi, my name is Sarang. Uh, I come from India, a Pune city, which is about 200 kilometers from Mumbai. And uh, I did my master's degree from Finland, from Aalto University, uh, School of Art and Design and Architecture. And my degree was Industrial and Strategic Design. And, uh, you know, you, the university is such an open platform. I attended a lot of lectures from Creative Sustainability. Uh, I attended a lot of lectures from, you know, uh, furniture design and some, you know, e economics and entrepreneurship. And it, it, it really influenced me a lot in terms of uh, understanding the world. And uh, that really has profoundly impressed me. And I still carry those values that Finland taught me. And you know, one of those values is uh, stay humble uh, and also the connection with the nature. And I think that is something which was very, very profound experience for me in Finland when I visited my Finnish friend first time in the summer mm -hmm. and went to the sauna naked That was the, that was the, that was an experience which I can't forget because it really liberates you. And uh, then the connection that they have with the trees, the farm, uh, it was something which I had not experienced in India because you know uh, we come from a very uh, urbanized city, yeah. and uh, it's very hard to see the changes in the nature around you. And Finland taught me to see those changes and appreciate those small moments. Mm -hmm. When I was in Finland, uh, I was really drawn towards the future of farming through uh, this, this book, this, you know, uh, magazine called Access Magazine, which was, you know, which is a Japanese magazine. And I read an article about how Tokyo is converting their parking lots underground into an hydroponic farms which basically means that they are growing green leafy vegetables just based on water and no soil and nothing else. And it's as pure as it can get. And uh, no carbon footprint on per, you know, traveling mile because, you know, it's right done under the parking lot in Tokyo. So I was pretty fascinated and I had few friends who were also fascinated by it. And uh, in the darkest winter of 2013-14, we started an experiment of hydroponics and aquaponics. Aquaponics is basically uh, a small number of fish mm -hmm. are put into a pond and you circulate the water and add a little bit of nutrients to the water and grow vegetables. So we grew some strawberries and we grew some lettuce. 
and uh, that was some that was a turning point we did like you know small prototypes in our uh, toilet <laughs> because you know toilet has a very good uh, you know moisture mm. and you know we needed the moisture for growing seeds and uh, that was a very very good turning point for all of us but somehow we couldn't get the funding that was needed as a startup Mm-hmm. and uh, by that time i was in touch back in india with you know like one of my uncle who has a who has a about uh, you know 200 uh, 150 square meter factory where he does manufacture industrial tools and industrial uh, objects such as some automotive parts on a huge machine controlled by computers and uh, he has a rooftop so he used to do like very small amount of agriculture on the rooftop mm. so i told him about the concept that we are doing with you know fish and with you know maybe just water and things like that and he was also interested so uh, yeah like i thought that maybe i can go back and do this but i was i was not really sure i had applied to few jobs and you know i'm i'm now like i i feel that i'm lucky that i didn't get any jobs <laughs> because you know i i, I was very adamant because i had done my uh, studies in strategic design and service design and i wanted to become one of those right away from the school right like you know like you had just graduated and you want to start something uh, you know on a good note but that didn't happen it was a good a good thing i think like you know looking back after four years five years Uh, i came back to india um so i w- i want to talk about this uh in details uh, in in a bit but uh, i want to first um ask you about uh just to, to say to to now know more your point of view how do you see the relationship between design and sustainability and especially food sustainability if you, if you if you like and but also um how do you translate this view into practice in your own work and you can again give some examples from if if you have any uh, you talked about some of the values and stuff you got from finland and but especially your education in also how did this shape uh, but uh, remi- i want to remind you that some of our listeners may not be so familiar with the definition of sustainability itself so you can if you can also expand your own definition um, Sure, sure, I can do that. So, uh, you know, okay, let me begin by uh, talking about sustainability a little bit because you know it's a it's a hot topic right now with you know climate change and Paris Accord uh, in place. So, you know, sustainability for me, it 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 really boils down to uh, how I can minimize my uh you know carbon footprint now carbon footprint is again a term uh, loosely used but it is it is basically what is the signature of uh, amount of carbon that you put into an atmosphere uh with your own activities so that activity can include uh, you know taking a moped or a four wheeler and drive around and go somewhere that activity can include buying something buying a device an electronic device which has been produced and also it has a carbon that has been you know uh, escaped in the atmosphere and then you use that device so that also you know gives out a lot of carbon in the atmosphere and then you dispose it off uh, f- for me the sustainability is minimizing this particular equation of putting carbon in the atmosphere mm-hmm. now how, you know how do you do it uh, there are plenty of ways i think you can go on you know instagram you can read some articles uh, one of the ways is to maximize the product life or maximize the service life of anything that you are using as a tool uh, that really really reduces the carbon footprint because if you use something in a short t- term and throw it away the carbon that has been uh, thrown in the air is divided by the amount of time that you have used if you use it smaller that means that you have put more carbon for the small amount of time so when you use a product or a service for a really long time uh, the amount of carbon that is put into the air uh, gets divided over the span of 5 years 7 years 10 years and that really really improves uh, individual choices 
in terms of you know okay well i'm using the stainless steel straw instead of a plastic one and i'm using that straw for past 25 years that means that you know that that one plastic straw uh, i have reduced as well as my carbon footprint for the stainless steel production as you know uh, divided by 25 years so that is the basic definition by which i tried to process th things and these all you know this this entire knowledge came from a lot of discussion with alto university you know and my peers and you know like like people uh, whom i studied with we had long debates we had long chats i i remember lots of times uh, you know in creative sustainability department in alto we had these you know dumpster dive yeah. kitchen you know uh, talks yeah. which which culminated always into these you know very very interesting discussions for me and those really informed me as a designer and that still gives me uh, you know uh, some sort of a line of thought when i design something another thing which is quite interesting in terms of designing something is that the you know the quality of material and uh, the authenticity that you use the material with that is very very important for me a lot of times what happens in typically in india in the indian context is that the authenticity of the material gets lost because of uh, high high cost associated with it and that cost is not justified a lot of times because you need to reach many people who need to afford that particular product or a service so here the balancing act of having some uh, some sort of you know a authentic material for a reasonable amount of price is 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 a is a very hard choice that designers need to make and uh, that really that really has pushed me to make some of those choices and you know one of the product that we will we, you know like we might talk about in the uh, in the course of this podcast is about the composting kit that we have developed here and i think the material choices that we have done there really reflect those you know those values that i uh, learned and practiced in finland mm -hmm. uh, and also in you know like alto university and you know people that have influenced me a lot so uh, yeah i hope i answered your question yes, yes definitely uh, and then now uh, move on to the home compost kits uh, especially um but before we tell what it is um can you tell a bit um more about the background of this project specifically uh, and how and why you decided to make such a kit and and all kinds of uh, background research you made before you started the design process yeah it's an uh, okay so give me like couple of minutes more time because i think it needs a little bit of background mm -hmm. uh, how we arrive at the compost kit so you know when we started uh, you know like when i actually came back to india and started this rooftop farming with my uncle as you know as as someone who just came uh, from abroad living 5 years i had this dream that oh you know what like i can just populate the entire city with these small small rooftops with you know aquaponics and hydroponics and we can you know make a sustainable business out of it mm. uh, which basically shattered uh, as i you know uh, dip myself into the reality around here uh, the reality is hydroponics and aquaponics are really good technologies only for green leafy vegetables if i want to uh, eradicate the uh, you know the scarcity of food and if we want to really really influence and make an impact on uh, food security for the world uh, aquaponics and hydroponics uh, might not be the only technologies that are needed to actually feed the world with protein and feed the world with good amount of food uh, more towards millets and more towards uh, you know lentils are needed for world uh, to get rid of the hunger uh, and as i was realizing that uh, also the business model did not fit in, in in a typical context in my city and in india where out of 365 days we have about 300 days of sunlight uh, out of 300 days of sunlight we have about 60 to 70 days of really harsh sunlight where we have to reduce the sunlight to actually grow uh, green leafy vegetables on the rooftop uh, and uh, that really uh, you know uh, that really pushed me to actually research about how plants are grown you know what are the main fundamental ingredients that are needed for plants to grow in a very uh, in a very 
like symbiotic way where we can actually you know uh, take the minimum care but as well reduce the uh, synthetic fertilizers and you know uh, synthetic pesticides and use organic ones and there you know uh, i i looked at the statistics and uh, I, i don't know if, like if you know the statistics but in india if you collect all the organic waste from the big uh, 10 cities uh, and if you make the piles like one pile of 1 kg you can uh, every day you can wrap the entire world with one 1 kg of pile so you know we generate so much of organic waste because of course you know in the cities uh, people live very close by and they generate a lot of organic waste and organic waste is a huge problem in india and typically in cities because cities are uh, city administration is not prepared to process uh, these organic waste in a centralized manner where uh, is there a uh... is there something like uh, what we're doing in finland like uh, when when people are uh, putting their waste uh, the day is is there a separation of organic waste yeah so you know it's a it's a it's a multifold challenge in uh, typical indian cities where uh, you have to teach all the residents to segregate the waste mm-hmm. first you need to segregate the dry waste and wet waste wet waste is mainly uh, you know organic waste uh like in finland you know i know in finland there are like six to seven different types of segregations mm-hmm. uh in india lots of people don't do those segregation because they just don't have the knowledge mm-hmm. or they don't have the patience to do it and i think this is like a this is like a generational change where you have to keep educating people to segregate segregate and then you know after 15 20 years people start segregating yeah. so what uh, what's the smartest way that city administration has done is that the new buildings that are coming up they have to they have to take care of their organic waste themselves so either by putting a large scale composting unit in their backyard of the building or an apartment complex or by uh, you know uh, employing people who can take care of it city administrations won't uh, pick it up for them and you know if they don't follow the norm there are few uh, fines and charges so uh, so the uh, new apartment complexes that are coming up they are now equipped with large scale composting units but at the same time there are so many people who just don't do composting as the main activity so you know there are these multiple challenges the first challenge is about education the second challenge is about behavior change the third challenge is is is, is more about uh, the product itself you know uh, even if people are ready to compost there are very few products which we found in the market which were hygienic which were using good technology but did not employ too much of uh, technology too much of technology which i mean is you know uh, you know nowadays there is a trend of uh having everything internet of things everything is controlled by your mobile phone you know everything is like there that oh you know i put something and then automatically in 5 minutes something comes out uh it's good like you know there is a there is a space for such kind of products but you know fundamentally if you look at the compost as as the value of any soil per kilogram the value is very less because it is in abundance and you are creating a device which is say about say 5 500 euros uh, to create a compost which is worth of 20 cents per day uh, this this logic doesn't go together and secondly if you if your aim is to reduce carbon footprint and if you, your aim is to help uh, you know people grow their own food in 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 their own neighborhood uh this particular high quality high high tech device won't really you know like like be enough and that's what our thinking was mm-hmm. before you know we, we we came to the conclusion where we said you know what if you want to do this urban farming if you want people to uh you know farm in urban areas we need to develop range of tools range of uh designed items which are easy to use which are easy to maintain as well uh, they they won't demand too much from people and that is how we came about in in terms of you know designing a compost kit 
so then what is what can you now describe what it is and i'm going to uh put uh, the um, all kinds of you know website links and social platform links in the description especially in the youtube version of this podcast but uh for the for the people who are listening in other platforms um i'm also going to i'm, I'm telling it also in the introduction so they can also go and see themselves uh, but can you now explain in your own words what sure. is home compost kit Sure. So, you know, uh, we, we really wanted to make the price affordable. So we really looked for the solutions which were out of the box and at the same time, which performed really well. So in composting, we did a lot of research on composting. What kind of composting is the best suited for a small apartment complex, which is basically a kitchen and a living room. That's it. And of course, toilet attached to it. So it's a uh, in that kind of a setting, how can you do composting? And we arrived at uh, different kind of non-woven fabrics, which we found that they are long lasting. They, they will last at least 10 to 12 years. Uh, they have a porosity, which gives a lot of oxygen to the composting. So there are two types of composting, aerobic and anaerobic composting. Anaerobic composting uh, doesn't use oxygen, but it uses its own microorganisms to create heat and change the organic matter into compost. In that reaction, what happens is ammonia is generated and which gets into water and which forms a lichate, which is basically a thick liquid that is very hazardous, that you need to treat it well. In aerobic composting, what happens is that the organisms which are uh, suited for composting, they thrive on oxygen. So we, it was very important for us to have a porous uh, non-woven fabric at a at a certain thickness to give the exact amount of oxygen to the compost pile coconut fibers now that coconut fiber is something which is uh, which is which is, which is basically uh, from the coconut trees you have the dry waste from the coconut trees which gets crushed and after you crush it, 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 it gets into this powdery form. Now, the, this, the property of this particular material is that it can absorb four times of its volume, the size of the, you know, the, you know it can absorb water four times of its volume. So mm -hmm. for example, if you have about say one inch of, uh, you know, coconut fiber, mm -hmm. it can absorb around, uh, you know, four times the four inch of the, you know, the water in it. So now what we did is, is basically we used these enzymes together with this coconut fiber in a format of a layer. So what happens is you basically form first one inch of coconut fiber layer. On top of that, you put your organic waste. Usually we advise people to put their organic waste by chopping it uh, less than an inch. Mm. Once they put that together on top of this cocoa peat uh, layer, uh, you know, coconut fiber layer, uh, we tell them to put one spoon of this enzyme powder. Now this enzyme powder is directly in contact with your organic waste. So it starts processing the organic waste. And then we tell people to cover it up with, uh, you know, coconut fiber layer again for an inch so that the process happens in the layered format, like a sandwich. Right. So you have a patty in between and you have like a little bit of this and you, your bread is basically, you know, like coconut fiber layer bottom and the top mm -hmm. now what happens is that uh, you know in your in our all organic food there is about 70 to 80 percent just water so what happens is that within a span of three to four days all moisture gets absorbed by the coconut fibers and the remaining part is composted by these enzymes and made it into a soil format with good nutrients for the soil and uh, this entire process takes about 20 to 25 days to complete it but uh, but by that time you keep on adding those layers on top of each other in this particular fabric bag so what we do in this kit is basically we provide there are three fabric bags 
there are you know there is an enzyme which we call soil maker powder as the name suggested it makes the soil uh, which is worth of like 50 days and we we provide you know uh, coconut fibers as well about 2 and 1/2 kg and you can use the entire set for at least 3 months and then if you find yourself doing it every day you can purchase that enzyme from us mm-hmm. and you know uh, you can reuse the compost instead of coconut fiber when the coconut fiber gets over so you can use the compost instead of coconut fiber for say next 6 months so in total you know once you buy a kit uh, we really want people to start right out of the box composting a lot of times what we found in india is that you know there are composting uh, products which you need to order something else after you order the kit Mm. or you order you know like you have to get like okay i need a spoon to just you know like like segregate this totally and you know so in this particular method there is nothing that you need you just need 20 to 30 seconds of your time every day to put it that's it so that's the kit wow um what has been the reaction so far so it's uh, do you have a specific profile of people who have bought it um so okay so you know here is the uh, hard entrepreneurship lesson you know uh, you are really optimistic you are you know you are like oh i want to i want to i want to change the world i want to you know like about 5% of the people of india in the city should use my compost kit <laughs> the reality is uh, most of the customers very very frankly speaking now you know i'm talking in terms of business language mm-hmm. uh, 100 people bought the composter if out of them 85 people would stop doing the composting after one and a half months or two months hmm. either they are lazy they forgot to do composting they didn't get the results as they wanted first time and then they were disheartened and they said oh you know this is not working or there were few bugs composting is a natural uh, process you know bugs are going to happen if we just need to make sure that there are no uh, unhygienic bugs and i think in the compost that we do uh, there won't be any if you you know follow this process that i just explained mm-hmm. few minutes back uh, but of course you know uh, so people give up Uh, out of the 15 there are very very strong believers of sustainability and those are the people who you know like stick with us mm-hmm. so those are the people who still after 5 years they keep ordering the enzyme and we keep helping them with whatever they need in terms of compost kits in terms of you know getting it out there and those are the people who are our brand ambassadors we made a very conscious choice of not spending a penny on on huge marketing uh because we wanted this operation to be handy we, we we wanted this operation to be uh you know customer driven or people driven rather than you know push marketing where you put like lots of banners lots of advertisements spend a lot of money and uh, get it out there the uh, choice was conscious why because we felt that this is a behavioral change for a lot of people and even if we bombard them with lots of advertisement people are not going to change their behavior until and unless in their own circle someone starts doing it and sure. they experience it and that is what is happening now we get you know uh, it's not too many of orders but we get uh, a few orders every week by references only mm-hmm. and that has worked for us i mean in a way that you know that the information spreads slowly and steadily and i think uh, yeah like you know that is how the response is very frankly speaking i you know i should tell one incidence i was traveling to munich uh, and then one you know customer sends me a message she said you know i bought your composter four years back uh, and she's she's one of those sustainable uh, gurus in her you know society or in her apartment complex and she's like i have used every composting system in the india and yours is one of the best and i'm i i really want to order uh, you know few more and you know can you just you know help me out with these these things and i was really touched i was i was really touched because the, you know this was the first time a customer an old one four years you know old customer is giving us feedback up even after four years they remember us with a product yeah and i think i think you know there is this uh, there is this activist in you which feels that oh you know you are making some change mm-hmm. and i think even if it is the smallest change it is a change and i think that's the, that's something exciting and that you know keeps us driving but 
Yes, and what you said is also important about you know people who who buy it and who like using it, who see that how difference uh, it makes, and then uh, this kind of people's experience being transferred to other people, I think, is the best uh, sort of marketing method for for what you and and also you know people like me also trying to do like this behavioral changes like real changes so uh, i i completely agree, agree with you uh, and but now your your work especially related to food does not end with just this one tool but there is this urban farm uh, project um so what is this urban farm project and how is it related to to the home compost kit and what kind of activities, experiments, uh, et cetera, are being made uh, in urban farm. And is it also open to everyone or is it a membership kind of thing? Like, can you just explain a little? Yes, so, uh, you know, in, in my city, uh, this kind of uh, project is very new and uh, we want to keep it open. We want to keep it very, very uh, like a communal place where people can come, get inspired. Uh, and maybe, you know, after they go home, they, they will start growing some lettuce or growing some spinach, you know, that's, that's, that's a success for us for now. Uh, in you know in a, in a very short term so what this place is 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 is, is basically about uh, about 1000 square feet uh, space where we have covered that with uh, with a uh, with a red uh, uh, sorry green uh, fabric which is called uh, you know which is called shed net which which basically gives shade to our plants from the sun because I told you like in India we have lots of you know like in the in the region that I stay there is a, the sun is a little too strong so we need to reduce the sunlight you know that is how the strong it is so so you know we have to put up uh, you know fabric on top of uh, you know all the all all the one thousand square feet of roof what we do is we do lots of experiments with uh, food and uh, in terms of how to grow it. So uh, there were a few, uh, you know, there are a few farming techniques that, you know, tell you that, hey, you know, like we need this much of soil for growing tomatoes. We need this much of soil and these many, uh, you know, fertilizers for, you know, growing spinach or, you know, uh, you know, basil or maybe lettuce. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to create our own soil. We don't buy any soil from anywhere else using the similar kind of composting method that we use in a smaller scale home compost. We use at a, a little bit bigger scale where we get lots of uh, uh, thrown away food and, you know, like uh, uh, food that is being, uh, you know, not used from nearby restaurants. And also we get lots of, uh, you know, dry waste, which is, which basically includes dry leaves mm -hmm. and a few, few, you know, sawdust uh, as a, as, as an, uh, you know, carbon, uh, you know, balancing act. And we put them together with our own, you know, like enzymes and we compost our own soil. So there is no external soil that we use. And what we do is we uh, reduce the height of the bed so we, you know like you know what we call bed is basically where we grow uh, you know these these kind of vegetables and uh, we have reduced it to about uh, eight centimeter so it's 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 pretty small yeah. so you know for that particular small amount uh, you know small depth we grow uh, we have grown lettuce we have grown brinjal uh, you know, which is basically eggplant in, you know, some, you know, some variety. We have the local varieties here as well. We have also grown, uh, you know, of course, lettuce, uh, of course, the different varieties of spinach. And, you know, there is, uh, there is a variety of amaranth. Amaranth is uh, far superior than quinoa, yeah. but at the same time, it is, it is a very locally, uh, you know, consumed vegetable. So, you know, we have grown all of those things and we do crop rotations in the small amount of, you know, that eight centimeter bed. So the size of that particular container or the bed is about three feet by six feet and the depth is about eight centimeter. So, uh, so because the depth is small, we keep rotating also the soil mm -hmm. and, you know, we, we generate the soil, we keep it inside. We generate it and we, you know, sort of repellish it again and again. And uh, that has really worked for us. I haven't seen this kind of a method for farming in urban areas where, you know, you don't have much space, you don't have much depth of the soil and you create your own soil and, you know, you, you basically start farming whatever you need. We have also farmed uh, wheat, 
we have also farmed some lentils and we have also farmed some uh, you know sugar cane i don't know if you know uh, you know sugar cane is like basically it's a, it's a grass variety which grows really really like 6 7 feet and it is it is supposed to be grown in a deep soil but we have grown that in in about say 20 cm depth mm-hmm. so these are the you know experiments that we keep doing and uh, what we do you know in there is that because my uncle has this factory uh, he has these workers in the factory and most of these workers they come from farming background mm-hmm. so you know they have left their farms uh, you know and and they they you know come from rural areas to uh, a factory to work so we tell them to farm and they use that output that has come from the farm to you know like feed themselves at some point so uh, that is how like we we keep you know like growing and we uh, these guys keep consuming mm-hmm. uh, and also of course we also take some of us you know like some of the spinach or some lettuce home you know whenever it is possible mm-hmm. uh, second thing that you know what we have done is we have grown a few trees which naming you know pomegranate we have grown uh, you know papaya and we have uh, you know like we are currently growing also banana mm-hmm. and uh, for that we have you know uh, created like a huge uh, you know cylinder which is about say 2 and 1/2 feet which you get like from oil uh, you know cylinders that you get like mm-hmm. oil tanks yeah. we have cleaned them up properly and we have chopped the top and we have used uh, that to grow these and to give the oxygen now you know like like microbes and compost need oxygen roots also need oxygen roots need lots of oxygen but no sunlight they they, they don't need sunlight so you know we have uh, punctured those uh, you know plastic containers with lots of holes so that the oxygen can go in and it 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 thrives so we experiment with say air pruning that's the terminology that people use is where you prune the roots by exposing them to oxygen and air and uh, same thing with the uh, you know same thing with the soil like we we use thin layer of soil but we uh, repellish the soil more and more often mm-hmm. and you know what is the end goal of all of these experiments we 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 really want people to learn these and uh, go back and do on their own uh, to begin with and secondly then we would want people to ask us or supply us products and services for them mm-hmm. currently we are really small so we can't supply services and uh this area is some something that people don't know about people don't have knowledge about and they expect service yeah. uh, rather than the product and then they start growing so our plan uh, before pandemic was that uh, we will have workshops on the rooftop because we have a space there uh, at least 20 25 people hands on workshop about how to grow food how to how to do transplanting of uh, you know uh, small plants into big pots how how to take care of how to do composting how to how to grow microgreens for example all of those you know those were three four courses that we had designed but you know pandemic happened and of course now we can't really have people over our rooftop so uh, since last february we haven't had huge groups so you know one or two people come and go and visit but we haven't started that so i hope that you know the pandemic gets over soon and we start that particular education you know kind of a thing uh i did not want to do zoom calls for this particular activity because you really need to put your hand in the soil mm-hmm. uh there is there is there's a huge knowledge uh, which which you miss if you don't touch the soil uh the you know the moisture the temperature the granularity of the soil really really speaks to you as as a person and then only you can experience you know actually growing something mm-hmm. and you know that's something we really want to give the tacit knowledge to people yeah. uh, so we are hoping that you know that happens and in the long term like you know like say the about 5 to 8 years we will uh, we would really love to have uh, you know rooftops all across <laughs> the world uh, using some of our techniques if possible uh, if not you know if you know we can help them somehow uh, we, we would love to why not definitely yeah i was going to ask you uh, in my head i had this how covid-19 affected because as you said it's very much hands in job and i mean you really have to be there you cannot grow something out of zoom and 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 it's it's also there's also a uh, kind of community building 
uh, around this kind of food related activities if you do this kind of workshops and, and experimentations with groups so um, yeah, I hope the, this pandemic ends soon for all of us. And me too, me too. Back to doing all these things. Um, now, and also, um, I want to tell that I looked at Urban Farms, for example, Instagram uh, page quite a lot. And um, you, you really communicate, I saw that you communicate a lot about this uh, this knowledge that you gained, such as there is a calendar, for example, what you can grow. And, and so it becomes, even if you can't be there in person for in whatever reason, you can still learn a lot from, from uh, what you have been doing. Correct. So I really uh, recommend people to go through to these. And I mean, you don't have to be part of this or you don't have to be in India. You can still, even though, yeah, the calendar is mostly related to, of course, what you can grow in certain uh, time of the year there, but you can, get an idea, I think, about uh, what you share on social platforms. Um, yes. Now, I, in the end, finally, I want to get back to the bigger picture and look at it in a more systemic way. And my question is, how do you situate tools like this home compost kit uh, or ex this kind of experimental spaces like urban farm in a sustainable food system? And you, you gave your your uh, definition for sustainability, but also can you give your definition about sustainable food system and how does it all go into that? Yeah, I was, I, I was actually going to come to that. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a far more important topic, uh, you know, if not now, then we have missed the boat. Uh, climate change is hitting hard and uh, I, my you know reading of the climate change is that we need to move towards a climate sustained uh, food systems as quickly as possible because when the climate change starts hitting within 10 years within a decade we will lose lots of productivity for the current crops that we are growing current cycles that we are growing i think one of the reason that you know we we really started this urban farming is, is because uh, we really f think that there is a huge carbon footprint involved in uh, getting farms, you know, getting something from farm to table. Secondly, uh, the monoculture of crops, it's really, really spreading hard. Uh, India is a tropical nation which had humongous, humongous varieties of rice, wheat, pulses, uh, millets, and which is slowly, slowly dying so hard uh, that we don't eat local anymore even in india because india is a huge country we eat rice we eat you know wheat which is produced like 3000 miles away 2000 you know like kilometer away not miles so uh, you know we need to really eat local and if you want to really eat local you need to know what local is and i think that is one of the reason that we put these calendars uh, for the regions and you know my uh, my dream would be to have these kind of regional calendars for every continent every country in the world mm. like for example i you know like i was recently talking with a scientist uh, you know and he is researching on uh, you know uh, food that is grown under uh, 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 you know, uh, under the soil. So, you know, lots of potatoes, different varieties of potatoes, different kinds of root vegetables. And, you know, we, we were just chatting about it and he told me that, you know, those are one of the highest protein and highest, you know, uh, nutrient giving varieties of crops that nobody is thinking about mm. in terms of climate resilient future, right? And, uh, you know, some of those varieties are already vanished uh, because of the monoculture. Yeah. So I think these are the things that, that we need to connect back to the system uh, of food production, food supply, and how food appears on the table. And, uh, and, 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 and the user and the you know, consumer of this food needs to make very conscious choice of having a diverse diet, which is climate sustainable. Mm. Right. So, you know, in like sitting in Finland, you can't have quinoa too much, too many times, uh, you know, uh, or like sitting in India, I can't go and have, you know, uh, like, like these, these, you know, very exotic varieties of tomatoes, which come from Italy. Yeah. Right. So, you know, I can have as a, as a, 
as a you know luxury right like in between of my meals of course i can i can just enjoy the food for its taste you know i i i love like shoot you know sushi and i love you know like the raw fish but you know i i i don't live you know nearby uh you know sea and you know that is one of the reason that you know i i need to eat the fish which is basically produced here in the in the nearby water bodies yeah. and also make sure that well you know what kind of food i am consuming and how where is that coming from and i think that that knowledge we can't expect everybody to have so that's why we need a uh, uh, government policies which uh, which enhance or which uh, which you know incentivize Uh, farmers small scale to large scale to go away from monoculture uh, to you know uh, start doing uh, start going back to the seeds which which were thriving you know few hundred years back and get them you know like like populated and get them to the market do a little bit of marketing and get them to the people and you know people are ready to pay for something like that i mean you know in india in europe i have seen in us as well people are ready to pay a little premium price as well for better grown food mm-hmm. it's just that you know there are no incentives because of the large uh, corporate firms who are controlling most of the seed supplies right so you know those are the fundamental issues and i think we are moving in that direction it's just that we don't have much time left <laughs> so you know that's the that's the that's the reason that you know uh, we need to push we need to talk about this even if people call you crazy that's okay fine you know in in next then years they will realize well you know maybe this guy was not that crazy or this girl wasn't that you know like you know now maybe she is making some sense but you know like as as more people get involved with this uh, indigenous seeds indigenous uh, methods would start reviving mm-hmm. i'm not saying we don't need gmos right like but i'm i'm saying that we also need variety mm. and give people a choice for the variety because people are not going to go deep they are not scientists they are not going to go deep in terms of oh you know what is this what is that they are they are you know there are lots of normal people who would love to eat healthy by trusting you and i think it is it is you as an entrepreneur it is you as a farmer or urban farmer it is your responsibility to create that and give them and tell oh, you know just taste it will you know you will feel good these are these 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 things make it make it very very simple for people to understand make it make it very intuitive Mm. right and and get them hooked to it because otherwise you know like we will lose this moment i think this this moment in time is very very important yeah i i completely agree and now is the time and a little bit later is going to be already too late and i completely agree about the whole biodiversity loss and uh well protection of seeds and there are seed banks all around the world and um it's it's and and i see that there are a lot of people uh, more and more people being active in the food system uh, demanding or or getting trying to get to know the right thing um i'm not saying active in the sense that they are hands in growing food but they are trying to learn more and they they are they're looking for it but um so what what personally for example i'm trying to do is to activate people however much they can or however they can, uh, they they would like to do uh because i think um looking at people who are not producing the food as just consumers is for me a little bit of a uh, old fashioned thinking i mean we are all more in the end eating cooking eating food and we all should be some kind of maybe instead of consumer makers of food and be more active however we can however We, we try to do i mean i'm personally trying to uh, grow some some herbs lately <laughs> oh <laughs> nice i chose the i think i chose the hardest time of the year <laughs> to start like november the, the darkest time so it's been quite hard <laughs> but but i'm trying i mean i'm i'm looking at, in my 30 square meters apartment what can i do in no that's of- great that's great i think you know like you should be able to grow uh, uh, microgreens very easily i think those are those are those are very very nice and very nutritious yeah so these are all my questions what is next for you and uh, hopefully when this pandemic is over of course maybe it's going to be more active um do you have any final comments or words 
no i i'm i'm really delighted i think you know you are doing an amazing job uh, in terms of getting the food food out not you know not the fancy food you know you are uh, really trying to get to the bottom of it and i know because of the you know the again the alto connection that you know there is this this kind of a very very uh, research oriented approach but very practical one yeah. and i think i i i still remember your final masters thesis mm-hmm. which was about this particular topic and that you are doing and i i i really appreciate you for sticking to it and i think you know there are very few people who passionately do something and you know like you are one of them so i i really appreciate it. thank you very much for in, you know inviting me well thank you very much for accepting and um i'll be following i mean i was already following your work this urban uh, farm and all uh, i'm going to continue and maybe one day if we get rid of this pandemic i'll come to visit uh, we are getting rid of it and i think in 2022 you know you can spend uh fin- finish winter in pune <laughs> that would be it will be perfect <laughs> because this winter for the first time in years i spent the entire winter in 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 helsinki not going to turkey yeah been a bit, i had forgotten how how dark it gets in in for the end of december so i was like okay yeah yeah so no yeah. i invite you i invite you and you know like maybe we can do like a small project on the rooftop and we can cook together on the rooftop itself and you know definitely why not i would i would love to have Let's you there let's vaccinate and get rid of this horrible yes. pandemic please <laughs> okay great so thanks again and bye thank you very much and have a nice day bye bye bye